work. Um, I don't know why I'm staring at that little bullseye. <laughs> Just like. Oh, before I forget, so your job is to kind of keep your boot right there. Because this is the, like the no, the no talk zone in here, but it's a little bit like the, the red button on the desk, you know what I mean? I, like, I just want to see. Um, I'm staring at that red thing again. Um, I just want to say that, you know, work, um, we all uh, have to work. And I think in my career as a, a professor and a writer, um, after a few years, once you kind of understand what the gig is, um, you got to have something else that gets you out of bed every morning to get to work and do the work, right? Besides just the work standing in front of you. I'm not the kind of person that kind of thrives on the structure of work. In many ways, I feel like sort of consumed by it. Like I'd rather be just doing my own thing. Like it doesn't make me, it doesn't give me, well, let me not get into trouble. But it doesn't, um, I prefer to have, someone was like, you got all day to figure out how to spend your time. I'm into that. Right, but anyway, I just want to say Samantha is one of those students that kind of got me out of bed every morning and to my office in a way that uh, you know my endless inbox never does. Um, <laughs> so uh, I do want to thank um, uh, Genev and um, of course uh, Raya for getting me here and um, all the work that they're doing to make this happen. And I also want to st thank the uh, the state of New Hampshire um, and the Portsmouth community for having me. I'm a Mainer, like uh, you know, through and through. Um, and working at UNH has been phenomenal. This is my fourth year. And, um, and I just, it's a little awkward, like, coming across the state line to work. <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating, you know what I mean, on, on a, my, my husband or wife, which is Maine. Um, so uh, I'm, this is like a good foray. into. it's really nice not to look out in this audience and not to see not half of you being kind of like from my graduating class in high school. Um, that happens. Like five-year-old kids will walk by me, and I'll be like, yeah, class of 98, you were, we went to high school together. So um, anyway, today, yes, I want to talk about curiosity. Uh, I admit um, that, uh, well, of course, I will do that like annoying English professor thing where I'll take a word and then put another word in front of it, and it'll be a different idea. But I, I admit that I wasn't that psyched to um, talk about curiosity because I don't think of myself as a curious person. So um, over the summer, when I got um, an offer to um, come speak here, and it was like, how does curiosity strike you? You know, and it was kind of like um, when you order, you like go to a restaurant, and there's something that looks really good on the specials, and then you kind of back off and like order something else because you're just, you don't trust your own instincts. And then <laughs> that meal comes, and then like you're looking at that meal, and you're like, I should have just ordered what I wanted. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about curiosity, because I just don't, I don't know, we all think of ourselves um, under a certain kind of lexicon of names and terms and words, and I just, curiosity didn't like, I don't know, I'd like to think of myself um, along some other lines. So um, maybe this comes from the notion that uh, there's that cliche about kids that they're always like asking why, 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 why. <laughs> Right? And I've got two little girls, nine and three years old. Um, they are both lovely in different ways. Um, and they're not why askers. Like, they don't really care why the sky is blue. <laughs> they don't. They're not like, oh, why is the sky blue? Like, they want to know what things are, but they don't really care why. And so I, I'm into that. And that's kind of how I was. I was the kind of guy, I didn't really care if, why the sky was blue. I was good with the sky being blue. <laughs> so. Um, I also want to say that I think curiosity tends to have, someone just clap for, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, who cares? Or why the sun comes up, every, like, I don't, like, it's good, you know what I mean? Like, we got a lot of other things going on. Um, so uh, I also feel like curiosity has a certain connotation, which is perhaps a modern connotation or a Western connotation, which has a lot to do with rationality, right? And if we can crack certain problems that are based on, uh, via mathematical or scientific vectors, we're being curious, right? We, all, we don't often hear the conjunction of, like, creatively curious. We have other images in mind. So um, I tried to be really instinctive with the images of curiosity that I feel like, for whatever reason, I have inherited. And by the way, you brought a tear to my eye when you announced that it was Chinese New Year. 
Like, I'm so used to in my life. My mom is from Thailand, and she, for much of my life, we kind of celebrated Chinese New Year in quiet. And there's some beautiful traditions that maybe I'll talk about. Remind me to talk, in addition to keeping your foot right there, remind me to talk about <laughs> how we celebrate Chinese New Year, because it's really important, especially after this like, weird holiday we just went through, which celebrates the birth of someone who I don't necessarily connect with. Um, I, I want to talk more about Chinese New Year. But anyway, these were the images, the Western images that kind of, for whatever reason, fell into the orbit of my imagination when I thought about curiosity. Um, why are they, like, what's this all about, right? Like, why, I mean, every, if you do that, it's kind of uncomfortable to put your hand on your chin. But the thinker is this, I don't, that's what I thought, like, he's curious about something, <laughs> right? Um, this is a Michelangelo. Does anyone know more about that than I do? Um, anyway, uh, this was <laughs> commissioned for one of the Medicis, right, in the 1520s. Um, and there's something kind of, like, sad about those guys that, like, doesn't really... I don't know. I don't want to be that person. Like, it's really uncomfortable to do that. Like, it, it just, I mean, physically, like, my body's not made to do that. So that's like this old school vision of curiosity that I thought, all right, you know, old curiosity, not my style. And then this, to me, was sort of the portrait of new curiosity, right? And now I'm noticing some of you are, like, starting to do the chin thing. Don't, don't, stop. But, okay, so there's, like, this guy, right? And he's got... I don't know, to me that reminds me of curiosity. And then of course his like emojification on the other side, <laughs> which I also don't connect with. I just, I don't know, it's something about that, if, if this is how I imagine curiosity, then I will instinctively disassociate myself from whatever it means. So there's old curiosity, new curiosity, and then there's the me curiosity, right? <laughs> so I, that wasn't like the pun, that wasn't supposed to be like the funny part, but I, um, <laughs> But it is funny now that I'm looking at it. That was taken by a wonderful photographer who's a friend of mine who I did a whole bunch of assignments with. Uh, for, he he uh, shoots for the Boston Globe. But we were doing this thing on, like, what does it mean to be a Mainer? And so he, I grew up in Brunswick, Maine. And he's like, well, let's go to Bowdoin College, you know, this institution of knowledge and et cetera. And um, I want you to, to, to take a picture. It was like 4.30 in the morning because he likes first light and I was sleepy. And he's like, I want you to just kind of like look curious, you know, like kind of look like you're intellectually pondering things. And I just was like, it was 4 you know, you're not pondering anything intellectually at 4.30 in the morning. And, and I just was like, oh, okay. And then he's like, put your hand like on your face, your chin. And that's when I kind of decided like this isn't working out. You know what I mean? It just was like, awkward. So then we have the old curiosity, the, the, the new curiosity, the me curiosity. And then the, the you curiosity, right? And this is what I think is sort of the way we are interrogating the very idea of curiosity in our culture right now. And I'm going to do that annoying thing that, like, as soon as people say this to me, like, the little kind of speaker in my ear just turns off. Whenever a conversation starts with, like, I was listening to this thing on NPR the other day. I'm always like, oh, boo. Like, let's talk about, like, let's get out of our, like, liberal echo chamber and, like, I don't know, talk about country music. But, um... But it, so it's like, so I was listening to this show on NPR and um, on Cosmos and Culture, which is a pretty cool platform. And, and so then I started to look at like the rhetoric of the text of that show. Um, and this is from September of 2017, right? So I went back to that story and I thought like, what were they actually, what's, what's like the language? How can I kind of crack the language code of, of that idea of curiosity? And so then I, you know, when you remove text from a radio program, things get a little weird, you know? Like you start to see it for like what the assumptions are. So the title was, A Study Finds Curiosity is a Complex Feeling, right? And I'm like, yeah, obviously, it's a complex feeling. But I do like the idea that they're referring to curiosity as a feeling, right? I'm, I'm not, for whatever reason, I'm tentative to describe so much of what I do as feeling-based. Maybe that's sort of a gender assumption, but this idea that emotion that, that these higher order functions grow out of us as emotions, as feelings, is really sort of a beautiful thing, right? That curiosity could be as emotive as exuberance or joy, right? So that's cool. I can get down with that. But the fact that it's complex, yes, we get it. And that a study would have to figure that out seems a little bit, I don't know, um, esoteric. Is curiosity a positive or negative feeling? And whenever I think of like, I, you know, um, again, I grew up Buddhist, so like everything's positive and negative all the time, like endlessly. 
You know what I mean? And so I'm kind of like, well, who cares if it's positive or negative? So yes, it's complex, obviously. Who cares if it's positive or negative? I just, there's like that, I guess there's the curiosity killed the cat expression. And if I had done my due diligence, I would like look into the etymology of that expression and give you some interesting story about blah, 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 like, you know, the Irish connection to the English and a cat and whatever. But, <laughs> but I, I don't know. Maybe it's a bad thing, okay? But, and then this is the one that killed me, right? This is the one that I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to throw this place under the bus. Because it said, unlike lust, and I don't want to make it weird, and I know we just had Valentine's Day and whatever, but like, unlike lust, the object of curiosity's desire is information, right? And I'm like, well, if given the, jo the, the choice between the object of desire of lust versus information, <laughs> like, I will take lust any day of the week, okay? Like, I don't, you know, like, that's kind of the word we won't say or whatever, but like, I, I, like, why would we think about curiosity if all we're getting is information out of curiosity? I'll take the thing that we're getting out of lust <laughs> pretty much, uh, you know, um, till the day I die. So, <laughs> boo curiosity, right? Like, <laughs> thumbs down. Okay, so there's like, the old curiosity, this is, and there's, a, my, my daughters used to love reading that book. I think it's kind of antiquated, um, Go Dog Go by P.D. Eastman, right. right? And there's that great, it's like, Dog's going up, but the dog's going down. And then there's that weird kind of like um, anti-feminist, like, do you like my hat? No, I don't like your hat. And she tries to get him to like his hat. And it's like, <laughs> but there's that great kind of sing-songiness to it. So I thought, like, in, as I was driving down here, I was like, there's old curiosity. There's new curiosity. There's me curiosity. There's you curiosity. Boo curiosity, right? <laughs> so that's kind of, that was like a good structural kind of mnemonic device for me to follow as I stare at this red dot on this thing again. Um, so I don't, I felt pretty comfortable not associating myself with curiosity. But now I really wanted to ask this, you know, um, to kind of assume the opposite, right? What if I said, Jed Coffin is curiosity. Like, I, I get it, this is who I am. I am gonna consider myself under that same kind of umbrella of identity as the, um, you know, the thinker or Steve Jobs or the curiosity emoji. So, um, I did another one of those annoying English professor things. I said, what is the definition and what do the semantics and kind of the, the language that we use around curiosity, if, what do we go back to the source a little bit and try to reclaim the meaning of a word like curiosity? And I was struck immediately by two words in that definition, strong and desire, all right? So the first one, strong, strong can mean all sorts of things, and the idea of strength obviously is not just physical, and I think oftentimes one of the most beautiful things is when we understand strength outside of a physical context. The other thing is desire, and I love the word desire. There's this wonderful quote that um, if any of you have read the uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Rules of Fiction, right, um, one of the rules among seven or eight is that every character has to want something even if it's just a glass of water, right? And I often think, like, books, I'm in the, the world of telling stories and writing and so forth, and we layer all this really complex stuff onto narratives about, you know, sociological, political, geopolitical, cultural, anthropological kind of uh, implications of a work that we do. But to me, all stories are just about, like, one basic desire, you know? Like, and, and typically, especially in the world of memoir, right, and I don't mean to be irreverent when I say this, but I know that a great deal of what I write about, right, I have parents who have kind of an interesting story of meeting and separation and culture, is, you know, really what I'm asking in these stories and books that I write is, like, mom, dad, like, do you love me? Like, are we good? Who are you? Right? I just want to know these really basic things. Okay? And yes, I like layer all this other stuff about, you know, monastic experience in rural Thailand and kind of the nature of identity and, you know, race and environment and so on and so forth. But at the heart of those stories is a fundamental question. Do the people who I think of as the most deeply related to me, do I fundamentally understand them and do they understand me? You know, and that is at the heart of so many stories, okay? So, I mean, you can take massive, 
expansive, not the great Gatsby, right? I, and, and I don't mean to, to say this in a way that's like, I'm so smart I can just think of any book, but I didn't think of, I, I'm not planning on talking about the great Gatsby, but I'm thinking like, what does Jay Gatsby want? He just wants his old girlfriend back, right? Yes, it's about the jazz age and the green light is a metaphor for whatever, blah, 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 and like America and capitalism and like, you know, 1920s, but he just wants his old girlfriend back, you know? And that's a beautiful, simple thing that we can all connect with. So curiosity, if we can reclaim it a little bit from what I think of is some misguided branding, it's this idea of strength and desire, all right? So um, I asked myself, when, what, what images from my past make me feel like that was me being curious? Okay, and um, this is a photograph that um, if you can't see that shirt, there's a, a Spider-Man <laughs> on the front of that t-shirt. And I used to, you know, I was a kid. I like to, to it's going to be awkward. I like to pee in my diaper as a kid, okay? <laughs> Just going to put that out there. I like to pee in my diaper as a kid. My mother said the only way I could get you to not pee in your diaper when you were a kid was when I bought you superhero, uh, you know, underoos. Yes, that's what they're called, underoos. Back in the 80s, everything, you know, underoos. And so anyway, this is me in my mother's village at probably two or three years old, right? And uh, the village is called Panom Salakam. It's about uh, two, two, anywhere between two and 12 hours from Bangkok, depending on traffic. Um, <laughs> it's in Cha Chung Sao province. Anyone been there? Cha Chung? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's not, it's not on like any lonely planet anything. You would not like go there and meet a cool Australian hanging out. Um, this is uh, this is um, our, uh, the the canal uh, that runs through the village is right under that bridge. That is my sister Tanta Wan, who, um, right behind me. That's my mother, okay. Um, and my mother was born in that village. She's the oldest of five. Uh, she met my father during the Vietnam War. Um, they married and came back to the States together, and then shortly um, after I was born, uh, they separated under pretty painful circumstances, and uh, my mother was left in the United States, um, or made the decision uh, to raise my sister and me in uh, Brunswick, Maine, without any family, um, as a psychiatric nurse working the night shift, um, sleeping when I went to preschool, um, with uh, a, a somewhat limited command of English with all of her family and all of her culture back in Thailand, right? So Maine, as you know, is, is uh, not mostly Thai. Um, uh, I, we all take turns in New England with the kind of the whitest state in America. You know, I think we're winning right now. Um, so every once in a while, we'd go back to her village, right? And I did not know what was going on in that village at two or three years old. One, at like the most severe jet lag in the cosmos will be felt between Brunswick, Maine and Phnom Salakam, Thailand. It's like 12 hours, right? So everything is in reversal. And I did not, like many second generation kids, I did not grow up speaking Thai, okay? So I couldn't really talk to anyone. Um, and like, you know, I grew up eating Cheerios. And you don't eat Cheerios in Phnom. You eat uh, thom, which is like a garlic rice broth soup, all right? So the world was weird to me here. As deeply connected as I should have been to this environment, I remember looking around the village and just feeling like everything glistened with this mysterious sense of meaning, right? It was like, you know, looking back, it was almost like um, a psychedelic experience just to be like, whoa, look at that wall. You know, like, there's a chicken foot coming out of that soup. Like, amazing. You know, and it, it really felt that way, you know, and like, even that woman riding your bicycle going by, I mean, I can still hear in my ear right now the sound at like 5.30 sunrise of the boards on that bridge rattling as people rode their bicycles to the market across. I can hear it more clearly than I can hear things I heard yesterday. That stuff is in there, right? But that is me being curious. And the thing I love about that picture, 
right? Besides the Spider-Man thing that will forever kind of embarrass me about my latent, you know, ability to grow up, was the fact that, like, this is my, curi my curiosity stance is not like this, right? My curiosity stance is like, bring it on, you know what I mean? Like, like what the hell is going on here, okay? And I think that really set a precedent for how I would operate in the world, right? Moving back and forth between radically different environments, we typically went to Thailand over our uh, December break from school. So I like was skipping Christmas. So middle of the winter, right? And we're dropped down in this village that is so different than the world I know in northern New England. So now I think, well, where did I get this curiosity? Okay, where did I get that sense of like wanting to know more about the world? That was, again, desire-based, right? And I look at my mother, okay? So this is my mother, uh, probably 1982, with her brother, who came to the United States by himself, also, to Queens, New York, where he uh, launched a bagel, uh, 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 a bagel business, where he roll, hand rolls bagels and sells them to bakeries. Um, I don't think we often honor the journey that immigrants take to America with traits that are positive, right? We tend to honor the desperation and the difficulty, but we don't often ascribe the kind of positive agency that is authentic to their experience. I know why my mom came to the United States, right? Part of it was because she was married to my father. Part of it was because she wanted to know what was going down in America, right? Yes, I live in Southeast Asia. There's all sorts of stuff going on here. There's a war happening across the border. But I've seen the Statue of Liberty before. What is that all about? Right? It's that desire to know more. And this, I mean, sure, call it intellectual. OK, maybe she was running numbers. Like if I can, and, and she has, if I can go to America and kind of launch a career and make a certain amount of money, then I can go back and send it home, which you know, is, is part of the deal in an Asian family, right, in a Thai family. But I think she also wanted to know, like, I want to know what it's like. Did they really have it that good? So then my brother, I mean, her brother came, my uncle, and he came to the States. So this is us going to the Statue of Liberty. I remember that day, all right? So this idea of, like, that deep, primal curiosity that's asking us to go other places, I think is in my blood in some way. So um, I also think that curiosity is, because it's been branded as this like intellectual kind of rational conceit, I think that it strips away what for me is one of the most powerful things in life, which is, and I know people kind of walk away from this expression, but religious experience, right? Um, I mean, I don't really, sure, I believe in God, or I'll wake up tomorrow morning and not believe in God. And I, I don't know, I'm just kind of like, I, I, I operate how I do. But I remember engaging with Buddhist practice as a little kid. You can't see the, the Buddhist shrine, but that was a gold, you know, you, you go, if anyone's, anyone been to Thailand before? Yeah, three. Um, it's, you know, you go in and you, you, you stick gold leaf on a statue, and it's um, on, a, on, a, on a shrine, and it's to, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, participate in the metaphysics of, of, of Buddhism. Um, but I remember sitting in that position. I remember putting the gold leaf on that image. I remember sitting in that position and being like, there is something here in sitting like this. I, you know, I was all of two or three years old, but I remember that feeling of, like, there's something here in this emptiness in my head. Everyone's quiet. There's smoke. This guy up on the thing is like looking at me with this really serene brow. He seems calm. I'm feeling calm. There's something in this little world of silence that I probably won't get a, my head around in any kind of like functional, rational way. So I'm a believer that the experiences we have when we are little, right, even if you are one of those children who says, why is the sky blue, right? Um, or, or if you're not, these fundamental basic experiences we have when we are little are the same experiences that drive us when we're older, right? We are driven by very basic needs. I think of when my kids get cranky. They are hungry or tired or lonely or bored. And the days when I'm, you know, arguing with my wife or having a bad day at work or 
you know, unsettled in my career. I'm usually hungry, tired, <laughs> lonely, bored, okay? It's the same stuff. I like to come up with more complex, like, therapy-based vocabulary for it, but it's the same stuff. I'm just like, I have a need, okay? And for whatever reason, that need is not being met. So when I think of the basic things that occur to us as children, they're the same things that we want as adults. I think that feeling that I had inside of me when I was three years old, contemplating the experience of whatever, emptiness, silence, compassion, that I saw on the face of the Buddha, it are, were the things that led me later in life to go out and seek the kind of stories that have launched um, a writing career for me. So when I was 21 years old, uh, I sat down with my mom and I said, you know, I haven't been back to the village in 10 years um, and I have some questions on my mind. Probably the same questions that I had in my mind when I was three and sitting, uh, you know, in, uh, with my hands up to the Buddha. And I said, I want to go back to our village and become a monk just like all my uncles were monks, just like the monks that I saw in the village uh, when, my, um, when I, re I remember this image of my grandfather dying, being cremated um, in the village in a kind of open air ceremony. And I was like, I, I, I still have questions about that experience, okay? It doesn't mean I was taking apart radios and putting them back together. It doesn't mean I was trying to like code my way into some new, you know, uh, understanding of how technology works in my lives. I just, I had an experience that still had a question mark behind it, and I wanted to get to the bottom of that experience, okay? And so I found myself 20-something years later um, interrogating that experience in a very real way, all right? Um, this is a picture of me, I, I, the running of the bulls in Pamplona during the, the, the festival of San Fermin. Um, I, after college, I, um, I had a desire to go out and, and, and sort of see the world, like I think many people do. I, um, this is a little bit of a long story, but I graduated from college. I went home, uh, worked on a lobster boat for nine months, took my savings, drove across country with plans. Um, uh, the, the pitch to my mother was that I'm going to be a teacher, uh, go find a teaching job. She knew I was lying. Um, <laughs> she let me go. I had money in the bank. I uh, drove my car all the way around um, the southern United States, uh, lived in Mexico for a few months, came back, went up into the northwest, um, sold uh, my car, bought a sea kayak, um, paddled it uh, about a thousand miles up the inside passage, settled um, in southeast Alaska, um, and worked uh, for the Alaska Native Brotherhood um, in a kind of an educational environment. Um, that's when I was fighting um, in bars uh, for a year. Um, and then after that, I had about $5,000, and I said, what am I going to do? I'm going to go uh, look at this world of kind of literature that has inspired me. Obviously, like, I was a 21-year-old male. I had some interest in Ernest Hemingway. I was reading about uh, The Sun Also Rises. And so I went to, to San Fermin, and that's where I started to learn how to ask questions, right? I had some curiosity, but I was also interviewing people and just talking to people about their experiences and what they were doing here. Um, so, you know, it quickly occurred to me that, like, there are ways that I can get stories from people. I can extract stories from people by asking questions as a storyteller. But I can also just do the stuff that they're doing, right? So I remember talking to people and being like, so why are you doing this? What's the history of uh, the running of the bulls? Blah, blah, blah. And then I remember the next morning I was like, ah, this is boring. And so then I just did it, OK? Um, and um, that was fun and dangerous. Uh, and yet, I still want to kind of like take it back to these fundamental experiences that I've had as a kid. And I, you know, um, anyone uh, remember this series? Yes. Oh, it's like warms my heart. The Last Electric Night. Okay, I think it was like renamed Sidekicks for some reason, it, like when by Disney. But Ernie Reyes Jr. Um, is a young uh, Filipino man who was like a martial arts master. This is kind of one of these like seminal uh, stories that guided me to kind of understand and think more about who I was as a young person. Um, the Last Electric Night is, you know, of that genre of like highly racist, uh, like oddly <laughs> orientalized uh, uh, kung fu productions that uh, we all grew up on. Um, Ernie Reyes is from the imaginary com Asian country of Patasan. Right? There's no, Patasan is not on a map. So um, his Sabasan, which is his grandfather, uh, is like a vaguely samurai-like master and um, teaches Ernie how to use, uh, like channel his thought into basically like blue waves of light. And at, you know, as a young man, he gets, they're like refugees from Patasan. His grandfather dies and Ernie's on his own to like kick ass. You know what I mean? And um, 
and uh, he fights Don Cheadle in the first episode, um, and 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 like does like this amazing you know sequence to like save an old man from Don uh, like an angry gang member Don Cheadle. So again, nothing that we would that would fly now, obviously. Um, anyway, but that idea of like the desire for confrontation, right? The desire to see like what that imaginary blue light like whether or not it was real, right? That, that kind of emanated out of me too in my own imagination, and so but when eventually I learned that like you don't actually get to channel blue lights, although those are pretty compelling, like to channel blue light into your body so you can beat up you know, a, a grown man, um, I found myself um, fighting uh, for about five years of my life um, in boxing rings. And when I go back to this picture, this is in Burlington, Vermont during a Golden Gloves final uh, tournament, but I go back to my, 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 my kind of memory of how I want to think of myself as curious, and I think, that is my curiosity face. It is. That's, I have questions on my mind in that moment. And I remember what it was like to be in that ring with that kid. Okay? And I remember in the, the, the bell rings, and we, like, step into the ring together. And, you know, as, as fighters, you kind of, like, spend a little time fueling out the weird space in between until you eventually physically connect and then you start punching each other. And I remember there's this like intense intimacy, right? And I use the word intimacy on purpose because of its other connotation, right? There's this intense intimacy that you share with another human being where you're looking into each other's eyes. And the question on my mind was not, am I gonna kick your butt, right? And it was not, what are you made of, okay? The question on my mind was by looking in his eyes, he was looking back at me, and the question in his eyes is, what are you made of? The you being me, right? And I find that the, the depth of curiosity that I feel, that I felt when fighting, right, is enough to kind of guide me through the rest of my life. And that intensity is, is, is like, what, what am I made of? A, when I'm afraid, when I'm really, really tired. Right? I fought amateurs, just three or, three or four round fights, three minutes long. But you are spent after two rounds. And then you got six more minutes of fighting. Okay? And I will tell you that if you have questions about who you are, you will find out the answers to those questions in the last minute of a fight. All right? And so when I look at that picture, there is some rage and some anger and some violence in my face. And I have some pretty good ideas where that comes from. All right? And I think we all feel it. And you don't have to fight someone to know what's inside of you. Right? But more than any of those other emotions, the experience that speaks to me right, in that moment is the experience of wanting to know something. I want to know who I am. Okay? We all operate behind these weird public personalities that we leverage in order to do various things. Connect with people, make money, um, deliver messages. But you can't lie about who you are to yourself in the last minute of a fight. Right? And um, so it's, it's that kind of curiosity that drives me. Um, and that's, if, if, if I have to ask myself, what is going on? That is the, that's the primal curiosity I'm talking about. So, now I think, like, all right, I've sort of broed out a little bit. I'm like, yeah, look at me doing all these cool things. And I was in Alaska, and I fight people, and blah, blah, blah. And, like, that's not the message, OK? I am not telling all of you that, like, you'll be better people if suddenly you uh, buy a plane ticket to some exotic locale and wander around and, and, you know, like, search on mountaintops for the answers to questions that you're still framing, OK? That's not what I'm interested. I'm just interested in the idea that somehow, We've convinced ourselves that the best way to answer questions is to think our way through them rather than to feel our way through them, to physically engage our way through them, all right? So the reason why I have this picture of my daughter, Jayen, and her best buddy, Reva, is because, as you can see, it's the middle of the winter, so it's cold. What you can't see is that our house is roughly eight feet away from their house. Right? It's cold, 
And I remember asking Jayanne, I'm like, all right, you, what do you guys want to do? Like, do you want me to, um, do, you know, do you want to watch a movie or eat popcorn or whatever? And Jayanne was like, Daddy, we're going to go build a house. And I'm like, well, you know, it's cold that we have a house. Like, it's right here, <laughs> and you're inside it. And I was like, and I love building forts. I was like, I'll come out and build it. She said, no, 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 I don't want your help. Right? And so she's like, can we just go in your shop and just drag a bunch of wood out of there? And that's what she did. And they built their own house. So it's this idea that, like, it's not real until, for a kid, unless they feel it on their body. And I think that is beautiful. And that is what I'm trying to say in regard to some of these other experiences I've had. So um, I also want to say that uh, curiosity takes us to strange places. So this is the bay where, um, where I, I grew up next to. And uh, you can see, sorry, lights. You can see that these little tributaries up here are a bunch of different channels. So about uh, once a week in the summertime, I bring my daughter down there. We go canoeing in the bay. It's tidal. Um, these are these little inlets, right? And we're constantly exploring these inlets, all right? One of the cool things we get to see are the, um, I'm sorry, what are the uh, horseshoe crabs mating, right? That's like an awkward thing when your child's five. You're, what are they doing, daddy? You're like, ah, hanging out. Um, <laughs> But one of the things she loves to do is like paddle up into these inlets. And I don't always want to be like, here we go, paddling up into another inlet, and it's, we're going to get stuck in the mud and then come out and then go to another inlet. And she loves going into these little inlets. They're tiny. They're about this wide across. And, and this is how we hang out, right? And um, yes, it's beautiful, and yes, it's tranquil, and I love hanging out with my daughter. But the things that we find by physically interrogating these inlets on this physical but also kind of creative map that we have of our own landscape is really amazing. So on our most recent trip, we paddled to the end of the inlet, and this is what we found in the middle of the woods. And the thing, my, my daughter doesn't know. She's like, what? Like, did this fall out of the sky? Like, how did this end up there? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an, a, an answer to that question. We want to get to the bottom of it. We could probably, like, go start asking people and, you know, go to town records and find out what year this car was. But just the magic of having a question to answer, the answer wasn't the experience. The experience was the story, right? We came back home with a story. We've got a photograph that reminds us that like, we went looking for something, we found something, and we've got a story that we can bring home, right? So I, I don't want to like uh, start a cult by any means, but um, uh, I, d I do feel like I could offer just a few little pieces of advice about what I think of is the kind of curiosity that drives me to do cool stuff and engages me to understand who I really am and what drives me. And it's this idea of primal curiosity. And there's just three things and then one little bonus at the end. Um, the first is that I tend, in, this, in my orientation to, to this idea of primal curiosity, to favor physical and uh, corporeal experience over intellectual or mental experience. And I understand the irony of that. I'm a professor. I'm paid by the student in New Hampshire to, 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 to sit in front of you know, text and analyze it. But nothing helps me understand my experience more than when I have something in my hands and when I can feel the experience running through every cell in my body. Right? The next one is that I think a problem we all face is that when we have a question, we can get an answer pretty quickly. But I don't think Googling stuff counts as primal curiosity, as fulfilling your primal curiosity. It doesn't. This is me. Googling, uh, like, you know, how many, um, how much soy sauce to put in, uh, you know, cashew chicken. Like, this is what it looks like, okay? All right, so that's me doing that, right? And then this is me asking Google what the meaning of life is, right? And it, it looks exactly the same, okay? Like, that, that, that should tell us, like, why it's wrong, okay? So, like, if you want to know the meaning of life, like, go look for it. Like, Put your phone away and go find some stuff and talk to people and get yourself in some trouble, right? Put yourself in the way of danger. So Googling stuff doesn't count. And the other rule I have is like, go, 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 just go, all right? Don't make excuses to, go, to, to not go seek out the things that you want to seek out. Just go see stuff, right? The, the, my biggest fail as a teacher several years ago, pre-UNH, was when I had a very intelligent student who wanted to write like a rhetorical essay on or per persuasive essay on the ethics of eating roadkill. Okay? And it was like March, and the semester was going to be over in May. And I looked at him, and I'm like, I always feel like with my students, there's a line in the sand. Okay? And I tell them, I'm like, here's the line in the sand. And if you don't cross this line, nothing's going to happen. You're going to get your, like, your B or your B minus or whatever, and you're not going to grow as a writer or a storyteller or a thinker. And here's your line. I said, you can either sit here and argue with yourself 
about whether or not you should eat roadkill. Or, here's the line, you can go hang around on the side of the road, wait for something to get hit, shovel it into a trash bag, bring it home, and try to cook it. And until you cook it and look at that thing on your fork, like, you are not operating in the proper creative space. And he never did it. And I still gave him a B, because he was well written. That was a fail. He should have gotten an F, OK? So anyway, go, go, go. Just go. Like, and this shouldn't be the mantra of the talk, but like, take your shovel and scoop up the roadkill and put it in a trash bag, OK? If you remember anything, it's like shovel, roadkill, trash bag. All right? <laughs> Lastly, that I think the difference in the way that we orient ourselves to questions, right, when we are being primally curious, is that we are not in search of answers. Because in my experience, I've never found any good answers to the kind of central questions that I've looked for. It's always been both, or this for a while and then that. Or I've made a fool of myself by contradicting some other thought or idea that I had about what the answer to that question was. What I know and what I can guarantee all of you and my students and the people who read my work is that you might not get, or you will not get an answer to the question that I pose in the beginning of a book, a narrative, whatever. But you will come away with a story, right? And when I die, I'm not afraid to think about my death. I think that's part of the beauty of living, is that I know I will die and be remembered with stories. No one will remember the answers I gave them. They will remember my stories. So the ultimate goal for me being a person who is driven by what I like to think of as primal curiosity, is that I will pass on stories um, to my children, uh, to my students, to the people who I know and care about, um, and to the world that uh, I leave behind. So thank you. <laughs>